The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And, of course, I'm Al Warren. Who else would it be? Uh, our co-host today is the doctor, Mr. Eric Shapiro. How are you doing, Al? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I, I, I was noticing, I don't know if you wrote about it in your paper, but uh, there, lately there's this uh, trend about the uh, kids are getting high on rotten meat. I, I know nothing. Are you kidding me? I know no. nothing about that. No. It's not my kids because we don't eat meat in our home, so... Well, how, how does that get you high? I can't even imagine. I'm not sure. Apparently, there's some you you get some sort of a high from eating this this rotten meat. And there's actually a guy on YouTube that has a channel that shows you how to uh, prepare it and how to how to age it for a year without having a ton of I guess little creatures all over it or something. He he shows you the way. And so all these all these young kids now are doing it and they're filming it and putting it on TikTok. That seems like an extraordinary amount of patience to wait a year. To, like, like, there's got to be. Better. I know. I know for a fact there's better ways to get high. There's not. Yeah. It's low on the list. I tell you. Well. Yeah. You know, strange world. Every day I yeah. have something new. Yeah. Uh, well, today we got a great writer on, and so we're glad to have him, Mr. Richard Chismar. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? I think we're good. Good. Um, staying away from the meat. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say I can, I can grow a magic shroom. Uh, it won't take anywhere near a year, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to wonder where stuff like that comes up because you know we hear about things like in your books too. Like, but you've got a lot of reality. I know we're going to talk about chasing the, the boogeyman. But there's a lot of reality in that. It always surprises me when uh, things are um, in real life and they seem to be much weirder than they should be in in a, in a fiction story. When people say that uh, life is, you know, stranger than fiction, yeah, they're not wrong. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm I'm looking at some of the Chasing the Boogeyman reviews right now, and I actually see there are people are like, "Wait, hold on a second, is this fiction or not?" Because it uh, it just had that 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 particular impact, which is the highest compliment, right? Yeah, it is. You know what? I was just talking about that with my son this morning because I uh, I read them uh, every time that we run a Facebook. Uh, ad for the book or my publisher runs a Facebook ad it's always fun to read the comments because they, they just come rapid fire and they're so contrasting I mean right next to this is my favorite book of the year and this is the best book I've read in the last five years will be this is the most boring book I've read this year I did not even finish it or and the big one is, is I was duped um, into believing this was real, so I hate it now. Oh wow! Oh, so that's not an uncommon. No, thing. and the thing is, is I just you know you, you never want to respond. Uh, you just like thank you for for buying it and and moving on. But uh, but I you can't help but feel like like look, it says a novel right on the front cover, and there's a disclaimer right on page one that says, hey, this is this is all because you know the author's a whack job and it's from his imagination. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I kind of like, I don't know, I feel old when I have these uh, these feelings. Like, I like, even if I felt duped, I think I'd be excited. I'd be like, oh, it wasn't real. Like, you know, it's part of right. the fun. So people get, uh, like, like ridiculously butthurt for right. no well, that's, that's My son, who's in his early 20s and, and will will just jump at any opportunity to uh, to troll me, um, actually, you know, came to my defense this morning. He's like, yeah, he goes, isn't that, you know, what you pay your 20 bucks for is to kind of be taken for a ride? Yeah. You know, it's like a movie or, or a good book, but. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I wanted to Blair Witch everybody with this book originally. I wanted it to be, I wanted it to come across as a, you know, a, a genuine true crime book. And, you know, I had ideas of planting fake newspaper articles on online and having a, a 1990s era website put, you know, on the, the Internet. So when people Googled it, they would come up with things. But the, the publisher squashed that idea right away. Right. What was the reason they just felt it was uh, it was too ripe for controversy? Yeah, and it, just the legal department, and and even doing it the way we did it, I I had three very extensive phone you know conversations with uh, Simon and Schuster's legal department, where and and a lot of permission forms, you know, um, just you know it was a, it made them uncomfortable. The fact that I used real newspapers and and uh, and and the photographs, you know, anyone who was in one of these photographs signed a, had to sign a release. And I'm like, you know, but I grew up with most of these people. They're they're fine. They're excited. They're happy. <laughs> it didn't matter. They're like, no, we got to get in in writing. So, um, 
and and the fact that I said it in my hometown and and you know my my real you know the real house that I grew up in you know and the neighborhoods and stores so they uh, yeah it just made him uncomfortable and you know again it, talking about my son he he said really early on when I told him what I was writing you know uh, he thought it was great but he's like no you can't try to pretend it's real dad he's like it's going to freak people out and you know s- someone's name might match someone's name you know f- who lived there and he's like you'll drive the property values down in Edgewood too and I'm just <laughs> so yeah <laughs> wait so is there and without giving anything away or giving spoilers, is there a moment where it tips and it's like undeniably fiction or not necessarily? No, there's really not. I mean, I, I okay. So you, it's poker yeah, I, I, you know, I talk, I, I open up, you know, kind of talking about my place in this small suburban town and growing up and my friends and, and then I bring us to, to age 22 when I moved back home after college for, for nine months, uh, I was about to get married and, um, and then these murders start, and everything except for the murders up to that point is true. Um, and and you know, people ask, did you embellish those childhood memories because some of them are pretty wild? And I'm like, no, you know, they felt sacred to me. And and plus, they were entertaining enough that I didn't feel like I had to. Um, and then even in relation to the murders, I tried to, you know, I tried to say, hey, how would twenty year old, twenty two year old Rich Chismar really react? And 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 that's what I wrote. And even when it didn't necessarily you know, shine a favorable light on me. Um, I, I tried to be as, as, as honest as I could. Yeah, so very much steep, steeped in reality. Right. Yeah, yes, sir. Well, and it's funny, too, because if you if you punch in into Google, speaking of that, if you punch in, like, 1988 uh, Maryland murders, of course, they oh, yeah. come up. You know, and Ale- Alexander Watson is, is a serial killer from that time and area. Right. So... You really can lead people in this. Yeah, and again, if I could have just planted that, you know, sprinkling of articles, it really would have worked. But, yeah, I, I, I'll stop thinking about that one day. Well, what is it you hope people take away from it then? Like, what do you, like when someone reads it, is it purely entertainment? You just want to kind of, like, freak them right out? Or is there something more you want out of it? You know, book? that's a really good question, and, and not many people have asked me. It, it's It's interesting because... When I started this book, it was just such a personal. It, I've told everyone it was kind of. I was always the you know the kid who was walking around with his friends in, in Edgewood, Maryland, you know, telling scary stories and trying to scare them. And it just felt like it almost felt like hey, we had a reunion of sorts, and this was the grown up rich, you know, telling his his version of the his grown up version of the campfire story, you know, about about spooky Edgewood. And so there wasn't a lot of. I, I, I should pretend like there was, but there wasn't a lot of kind of uh, you know deep thought put into that. I just wanted to kind of tell a story set in my hometown. And, you know, what it ended up being without me realizing it was a, was a couple of things. One was a love letter to my to my, my hometown. And then the second thing was is a story about the loss of innocence, not only for me. Um, you know, this was my safe place for 22 years almost. And then uh, but a, a loss of innocence for a, for a place and a time being, you know, 1988, small town, Maryland. And um you know how once you do that, it's, it's kind of hard to ever get it back. It's, you know, once the shine's gone. So, yeah, I, you know, I hoped it would be an entertaining book. I hoped it would be a book that uh, that maybe said something about what it was like to grow up in a small town in the '80s. And um, yeah, but but other than that, yeah, no, I I, I tell people I don't, I don't I don't think I was really smart enough to to, to kind of put in you know more thought into that. Or same thing when people say, oh, it's such a great idea that it's modeled after a true crime book. I'm just like, to me, that's just the way the book needed to be written. So that's why I did it. Right, right. Well, and then, but, but sometimes you look back on a book when you've finished it, and it kind of gives some, something that you want to convey, but you didn't really realize it in the writing. Of it. And I think it was that what it was like, you know, to, to grow up in that small town and that loss of innocence. I... I didn't really think about a worry about the book, I should say, until about a month before it was due to be published. And then all of a sudden I started thinking, huh, I wonder if this because it's an odd book. To, it's I mean, it's an odd you know concept to make yourself the main character in a book, especially when you're, you know, you're kind of a nobody like me. It's not like I'm Stephen King who wrote himself into the Dark Tower series. That's that's a little different. Um, so, yeah, about a month beforehand, I started thinking, what the heck was I, you know, what was my plan? Because why do I think people are going to be interested in Rich Chismar's uh, childhood in Edgewood, Maryland, and, and, and these murders? Um, you know, are they going to be able to relate to something so personal? And then right away, and I mean on day one when I started seeing the uh, the, the reader reviews pop up, 
it, it, it's like a light bulb went off in my head because I, I, I remember thinking, Rich, of course, you know, you, you, this isn't just your story. You wrote a lot of people's story. And, and that's that's what I was hearing. People said, oh, my God, I didn't think about popping tar bubbles with my toes on the road. I haven't thought about that in 30 years. But the minute you did it, I, I was there again. And the same thing with throwing crab apples at cars and climbing trees. And I had people write. And, and they said they finished that first chapter in tears because it was their childhood I was writing about, and no one had reminded them uh, of what it was like uh, as effectively as I had. And that, that's a great, you know, it's a great feeling to have someone tell you that. So now your characters um, in the book, are they all, all based on real people? That you no, know? you know, it, it, the, all the friends who I mentioned by name in, those, in that opening long chapter are, are, you know, guys I'm still – uh, I'm still friend with today. So, yeah, in that case, yes. And then once we get into the, the expansion of the story, um, and, and, yeah, my family, I wrote about my mom and my dad and my, you know, my brother and my sisters. And, yeah, all, all real people. You know, fortunately, most of them still with us. Uh, you know, my parents have been gone for a while, so it was a, it was a treat to write about them in the book. Um, but then you get to the, you know, the story, it kind of opens up. And, no, you know, the, the, the main detective is, is not someone, um, you know, uh, several of the town people are, are, are made up, although several are, are also real. And then the big one is kind of my cohort in, in the story is, you know, this, this 22-year-old girl. And she's, uh, yeah, she, everyone wants her to be true, uh, you know, a real character, but she, she was not. She, she's someone who I made up. And I disappointed a lot of people with that. Carly Albright is her name. And uh, I, I think a lot of people kind of wanted to hit me up for her number when we were finished. I had to tell her, I made her up. She's kind of a com- combination of several different, uh, I grew up with three older sisters and my wife's a very strong woman. So she's kind of a combination of a bunch of smart asses I know in real life. Um, so you're going to continue with the quote unquote character of uh, Richard Chisma, right? I am for one more book. And that's what I told my, my editor and my agent. I said, I really want to write a sequel. Um, you know, I feel like the story's not finished, and, and that was a surprise to me. It came as a surprise. Um, but then I had to tell I said, I promise you I'll never write about myself again because, you know, like I said, it's an odd thing, and, and for a guy like me who, who definitely prefers to be behind the scenes, I, I don't get out much. Um, even when the world's in good shape, I'm, I'm not someone who goes to a lot of conventions or, you know, book conferences, those kind of things. Um, so yeah, it was an odd show. It was that was an odd phone call when I had to tell my agent. Guess what? I, I finished this book. I, I didn't tell you I was even writing, and I'm the main character. So I, I don't I don't want to do that again. <laughs> wow, it could have the impact, you know, because the book has been so successful, and I presume uh, what comes next will, will, will match it, if not more. So it could have the impact of amplifying you, and then you become an iconic character that they <laughs> want. Six more. Yeah, no. That, yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully it's a question. Yeah, no, it's yeah. uh, a boogeyman to rest with the next one, and 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 also Richard Chismar as a character. Is he is uh, Chismar the character around the same age as you are right now, or is it like ten years ago, or how how does that? In the work? new book. Uh, or yeah, the new book. Yeah, yeah. In the, the new book is is going to be you know modern day because w- with boogeyman you know I went back to. Um, you know, the 22-year-old Chismar, um, and that's Got the, it. that's the meat of the story. But then there's an afterword which brings it to, you know, modern day in which the boogeyman is, is, is you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not really a, a spoiler, but the, the boogeyman is, is brought into custody. And then, you know, the, the next book continues on from modern day, and, and it'll talk about, you know, the success of the first book and how it's affected my life, and then, I'm caught in the story again, and bad things happen. So you think I learned my lesson? Wow, so that's kind of badass. So okay, so in other words, you, you okay, so the book still carries, and it is now, and you, you still are maintaining the, the poker face. Oh the yeah, refers to book, the book one. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay, no, that's so, really cool. So that's that's. I think you know that's the challenge is to, is now from page one to. Uh, you know, to to kind of let the reader into my intimate life so much, so that it's you know the 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 dark part of the story that follows is believable, you know, and and I'll have right. photographs again. You know, I had a bunch of photographs in the first one. We're going to do it again, and uh, yeah, I, I'll just uh, I'm going to play it straight for for another three hundred pages, and then and then be done. Nice. It, it, I'm trying to think of examples, like you said, Stephen King with the Dark Tower. Another one that comes to mind is, uh, I know Brett Easton Ellis did that with uh, Lunar Park. Yes, yes. Uh, which everybody said was a very Stephen King-like among his books. Right. But I can't, that's all that comes to mind. So it's a very unique thing to do. Yeah, and I, I again, it's especially unique for, you know, for, uh, 
for a much lesser known writer than those two folks we just talked about. But again, uh, you know, people, I, I'd like to be say it was this brilliant idea from the start, but no, it's just, it's the way the story wanted to be told. And, and, uh, nice. it, it, so I rolled with it. So when you're in the first person, so, okay. So the, the preponderance of what's happening is fictional, right. obviously. Uh, but you're in the first person, so like you said, with the tar bubbles, you're essentially expressing yourself as you. It's like it's almost like it's you under other circumstances. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, so you play it. It's, so it's not like when you're there writing in the first person, you're crossing a bridge into some alternate matrix of behavior. Like like it's still Richard Chismar. But it's just that the uh, scenario never happened. Right. Exactly. Okay. I mean, we, you know, when I was 22 and I moved back, there was a, there was a bunch of home invasions and the, the local newspaper called the guy who was doing it, the Phantom Fondler, which, you know, at age 22, I thought was hilarious. But then, you know, you put yourself in the place of the, the women who he, he was breaking into these homes and he was uh, at night and he was caressing women, their hair, their, their leg, and they would wake up and he would take off. And the entire town, it really did affect the town. I mean, it, people started buying dead, more deadbolts and floodlights, and there were rumors that people were buying guns and setting traps out because he did this over 30 times and he was never caught. So that's, that's where it came from. Is, uh, you know, as a 22-year-old starting my horror publication, moving back home before getting married, um, I, you know, I lived through all that. And because I was that guy, you know, I kept waiting for this, this bad guy to escalate and to do more. Um, and, and that's kind of where, you know, the book chasing the boogeyman was was my answer to what would happen if he did more. And, uh, you know, how would the town react? How would I react? Um, right, and right. So that's that was kind of what happened is it, it, there was a germ of a, you know, of a, of a real thing going on that I that I, you know, took off with. And um, mm. yeah, so I just made it much worse. Wow. Well, yeah. There should be a term for it because it's always like not an alter ego, but it's like an alter scenario. Right. Um, it's like if the fork had gone the other way. Yeah, it's almost like uh, alternate history on a, on a very intimate scale because you know, right, I'm right. I'm trying to rewrite World War II, or uh, it, right. Just, you know, I'm rewriting what you know, the reality of the small little town. And do you feel in the course of doing so, you, were you like really? Because I'm getting from what you're saying that you're you know relatively private and low key, but in the course of depicting yourself as this character. Did you find you were like opening veins? Like, was it very vulnerable, or was it more focused on on the events and the uh, and, and the drama external uh, to to your psyche? You know, it was it, it it depended on the day. You know, I did I wrote about some things and, and and some memories of my father and and a moment that I had one night when I was like fifteen after sledding with my friends and I was left all alone on the hill and I and I remember, you know, I just remember having these deep almost like Kevin Arnold moments from the Wonder Years television series where I heard my inner voice and it was like, you know, everyone's going to leave. You know, all my friends, we're all going to move away in a couple of years and, and, and our parents are going to pass and, and you know, life's going to be different. So I, I wrote about some of those moments that, that I've never really shared with anyone before other than maybe my wife and, and a couple that I've never shared with anyone. So, yeah, they, in, in some ways it was like opening up that vein and then, in other ways, you know, I referenced my parents have been gone for a while, so uh, they were they were back for the you know four months that it took me to write the book, and that was wonderful. And the same thing with my childhood friends; we were all together, you know, trading baseball cards and shooting marbles and stuff the way we really had. Um, so in that way, it was just such a joyful experience. Um, yeah, it sounds so. Like, you know, from citing the Wonder Years and just talking about these uh, these parts of the experience, it sounds like there is a. Um, and nostalgia to oh, it also. big time, big time. Yeah. 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 I mean, one film producer said it's it's Silence of the Lambs meets the Wonder Years. That's a good segue to your relationship with King because, you know, as much as he's this horror suspense giant, I, I don't think any writer has put a lump in my throat as much as he has in terms of uh, just, you know, sentimentality or nostalgia or just taking you back to, like, wistful yearning of youth. And so is that something the two of you – have in common or am I stretching on that? No, I, I think we absolutely do. I think he's, he has better control over that. I think sometimes I go over the line and, and he probably want to kind of, he probably kind of wants to pat me on the head and say, all right, Rich, a little bit too nostalgic, a little bit too sentimental because he knows where to pull his punches. And, 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 and I'm still learning that I think, but, uh, but no, absolutely. And, and what you said about Steve is, is, you know, a, a lot of just, you know, surface readers who don't know, you know, the, a large body of his work. They they just think he's the the scary guy. And but but like mm. you said, I mean, he 
he knows how to, to find your heart and uh, how to work those strings. And um, Yeah. And the fact that, I mean, that you, you have that skill also just makes me think that uh, it's, it just makes the horrific dimension of it so much stronger because you're earning the reader's trust and intimacy in, a, in another bed of emotions. It's just, so it's like, you know, if you, if you have more of the lay of the land and you can connect with their heart, then it's like when things get scary, it's, it, it's that much scarier. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I yeah, and again, it, you know, with Boogeyman, I, I had a lot of reader comments saying there was so much heart, um, you know, in this story. I've never, you know, I've never read a serial killer story with this much heart. And and again, it was it wasn't part of my master plan. But you know, when you're mixing real life affection for family and friends and a place um, with bad things happening, you know, it, it's that's liable to happen. So I, I, I lucked out in that regard. Yeah, it sounds like it's who you are. Like, there's a warmth, and, uh, you know, it's, it's inevitable, especially because you made yourself the main character, so, so it's coming in through that door also. Right. Again, that's again that's why I ended up being the main character, because it, it, it became apparent very early that, you know, I can't fake this one. You know, I can't, like, name this guy someone else and just pretend like he's, you know, some other first-person narrator. This is me, and, and I'm not a good enough writer to fake it, so I'm just going to make it me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't sell yourself short. It's funny you're saying, uh, like, you're an unknown. It's like uh, you are a New York Times bestselling author. I'm looking at all these things. You have thousands of Amazon reviews. So it seems expl like explosive success. I also know in the quote-unquote horror community, which is not a phrase I always use, uh, you, you know, you're, you're one of the leading figures with Cemetery Dance. And so I'm curious about that, too. Does that So your publishing company, Cemetery Dance, is that still – Keeping you very busy? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I have a full staff now, so it, it's, uh, okay. it's you know, I'm able to write and do, you know, all that. But, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm like a dinosaur in the horror field because I've been, you know, Cemetery Dance has been around for over 30 years. Um, okay. And that's that's not very common. So, so yeah, in that regard, yeah, yeah folks kind of know who I am. But when it comes to my own writing, you know, I've been doing it for a long time, and I've had, you, you know, s some really solid, you know, critical success and, and all that, but mm -hmm. yeah, it wasn't until Gwendy's Button Box with with Stephen King, you know, back in what was I like five years ago, that where I kind of became that overnight guy, you know, as a writer. You know. Well, how did that happen? How did you uh, start working with him? Um, you know, r right from the time I was that the guy I was writing about in Boogeyman, the twenty two year old who started a little magazine when he was still in college, and uh, and then just never stopped. I sent him every issue of the magazine, and then I started publishing books, and I sent him every copy of, of each book we published. And I was just that guy down in Maryland saying, hey, you know, Mr. King, you know, I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you, so thank you, and this is my latest. And, you know, periodically asking, if, you know, if you might send me a story for the mag or blah, blah, blah. And he did, you know. Like three years in, he sent me a short story called Chattery Teeth for the magazine, and then maybe 10 years later we published uh, our first limited edition of a Stephen King book um, from a Buick 8. And then, you know, we built this business relationship over the, the next decade. And then at some point it, it turned into a friendship, you know, with a lot of emailing and texting. Um, you know, we're both like, you know, we're both uh, private people. Um, you know, we're both uh, baseball fans. We, you know, we love our dogs. We love our families. And, and those are the things we talked about. We very, very rarely talked business. It was always books, movies, family, dogs, baseball. And, and, and yeah, we built a friendship. And then at some point, uh, you know, down the road, we were talking about collaborations. We were, we were emailing back and forth and, and round robin books, like where you have 10 different authors, right? That, you know, continue a, a story. And, and he mentioned Gwendy's button box. And then the next day, you know, I got the email with the attachment and he's like, do you do with it, you know, do what you want with it or something like that. And I, I wrote him back and said, you want me to finish it? And he's like, if you can. And that was that. Wow. Just, just picked it up and ran with it and prayed that it was, you know, it, it, you know, it, yeah, the whole thing, honestly, you, you know, as cliched as it sounds, I'm being 100% honest, the whole thing is still like a dream that I, I yeah. look back and I'm like, how did, I don't even, people say, well, you know, how did, how did you write it? What was your thought process? And I said, honestly, I was so terrified in the beginning that I, I yeah. finally just put the pen and pad down and said, just write, just write. And somehow I, I, you know, like an hour into it, I found myself in Castle Rock, Maine, and I don't remember anything else. It's just, you know. I, I have no idea how I rose to that occasion, but, uh, you know, I'm very grateful that, that it happened. Yeah, eventually you just have to go into your own toolkit, the same one you've always had, and be like, okay, like, you know, just, like, ignore ignore the context of what's going on and right. uh, just make it happen. Uh, wait, so he had sent you a partial or an incomplete manuscript, and he was seeking completion. Right. 
Yeah. Was he seeking it? Was he seeking it in the sense of, hey, Rich, I painted myself into a corner here, or I don't know where to take this thing, or my emotional energy is waning, or, hey, Rich, I love you as a writer. I think you're brilliant. Uh, you know, let's let's rise with the same tide. Like, what was the mentality? Or do you not know? Well, what's funny is I didn't know at the time, and I did. I never okay. even thought of it until we did uh, we did a joint interview for the audio version of Gwendy's Button Box. And the, okay. the, the woman who, the publicist, a uh, very nice lady who did the interview, she asked Steve, she said, uh, you know, so essentially, you know, why Rich? How do, you know, why did you pick Rich? And, and I remember I, like, I froze because I was like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> I, I, why hadn't I thought of this before? And I was where I had what the answer would be. And he essentially just yeah. said I, I had, he had just recently finished uh, a short story collection of mine called A Long December. And he said Rich writes the uh, – you know, small towns and uh, the everyday life and the everyday families and going-ons of, of Americans. He said he writes that really well and with a really warm touch. And he said, you know, it, I, I felt like Wendy's button box, if anyone could finish it, he could. So that's that's how it came about. And, you know, the the beginning of that email exchange was me saying, hey, what do you think about Round Robins? Um, because I have this idea where I might ask six or seven or eight different writers to, to, to complete a narrative and each one write a little chapter. And, and you know, yeah. he was essentially like, ah, oh, you know, I don't think they usually work, but, you know, collaborations. And then that's how we got to, to Button Box. He said, I've had this story I've never been able to finish. And uh, I was like, oh, I'd love to read it. But I, I just meant read it as, you know, as a fan. Sometimes that's the cool thing with being friends with Stephen King. Sometimes they'll send you a manuscript really early and you get to read it for yeah. everyone else. So, yeah, the idea of, of uh, you know, I, I'm crazy and I'm a big dreamer, but I, I've never, ever, ever would dream that big to think, you know, I could write with them. So it was a happy wow. idea. Wait, so, why, it, it, finishing it, does that mean going through Stephen King's uh, parts of the manuscript and tuning them, or does it mean literally taking the torch and like, okay, it stopped here and I'm going to imitate the voice that was already there and take it to the end? Like, what was that like? It was a little of both. I mean, and that's the thing. I never okay. thought about imitating. I, I That was okay. Yeah, that yeah. was the big thing. I never tried to, because I couldn't. You know, I just had to write as myself, which fortunately is very, you know, I think it comes across as very cinematic and very intimate, like like a lot of Steve's work. Um, but, okay. but yeah, no, I, I and did I rewrite some of him? Yeah, and he re rewrote me and... Uh, you know, especially the ending was, you know, was was, was a true collaboration. And it, it, that was kind of stated early on, you know, hey, you have free reign with me. I have free reign with you. Um, let's not paint ourselves into a corner idea wise by being too specific. Let's just send it to the other person and let, let them pick up the ball and run with it. And, yeah, it was a dream collaboration. And the fact that it was kind of with my, you know, one of my literary, you know, fathers. It's ridiculous. It's still ridiculous that we're talking about yeah. right now. <laughs> wow. It sounds great that you answered my next question in terms of it sounded like there was a real intuitive bond. Like it wasn't like, okay, we're going to have pedantic four-hour meetings and plotter every move. It was more like you're, you're both just emotionally accessing it. And I, I love hearing that that's how he works because when I read his writing, I'm like, there is such a spontaneity and energy that it, that, that was always my, my guess that he's on some level he's winging it, which is why it's brilliant. Oh, on all levels. And I mean, I told him that with, yeah. you know, with the third book of what, what's turned into a trilogy that, that we finished and it'll be out early next year. But when we wrote uh, Gwendy's final task, you, you know, it was a larger scale. It was a full length novel as opposed to button box, which was a novella. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were writing larger chunks of, of page counts and sending it back and forth. And he just, Absolutely no, you know, no outline, no uh, other yeah. than just the germ of an idea of what comes next. And and I, it, it, it was essentially hold on because here comes the roller coaster. And it was yeah. it was such a cool experience. And again, I look back at it, I'm like I have no idea how I did it. It's done and yeah. it's on there, and and it that's dream come true stuff. Wow, it, so it sounds like you're very your work is very emotional. So it's like. It, when, when you go too hard on the outlining and the uh, the micro planning, it can sort of constrict constrict the emotion. I'm not sure if you're an out, are you more of an outliner when it's just you, or mm -hmm. or is it more like like just gut level? What you know, I'm not an outliner, but I have outlined parts of uh, of my last two projects, even including chasing the boogeyman. But only because with boogeyman, the ideas started coming so fast and furious of of things that I wanted to include that I was afraid if I didn't write them down. 
I would forget them no matter how significant or important they felt because I've learned that lesson in the past. You know, you have a dream and you're like, I will never forget that dream because it is brilliant. The time I eat lunch, it's like it's gone. I'm like, holy, you know, yeah. holy hell, I can't, I can't remember one part of it. But with, so, so, yeah, I mean, and what I found is that when I do have an outline, um, my brain works, you know, uh, messily enough that, that I, I don't feel like I have to stick to it. And, it, you know, it doesn't feel like it's gospel. Um, but because I have the, the, the structure there, I, I can write really quickly, um, which, which is nice sometimes. But, uh, but no, with like with the, most projects, I don't outline. And with, you know, with Wendy's final task with Steve, I didn't outline anything because uh, there was kind of no, it just didn't feel like it was right, number one, but there was kind of no time to do it. You know, he sent it to me and it's like, oh, it's my, it's my 50 pages next. Let's, and then I sent it to him and he would just pick up and, and run with it. And that was fun. Wow. And, and getting back to this imitation thing, I mean, the, the imitation might not be the, the right word because it robs some of the poetry of it, but you're, you're blending and matching and sort of like picking up on what he, what the other is doing with economy of phrasing and style and vocabulary. Like you're just intuitively both reaching each other in the middle with what the voice is. Is that yeah. how that goes? Yeah, it, it, it's definitely more yeah. that. I mean, because people said that, did you try to? And I'm like, no, because if I did, it would have, it would have come off as, as, as not honest writing and, and it probably would have come off, you know, feeling kind of plastic. So, you know, but with that said, it, did I, uh, did I absolutely seize the opportunity to, to have goose flesh rise on somebody's forearm because Steve has had that in, you know, like all his books. Absolutely. You know, that, that was part of the just yeah. the pure joy and fun of it was to, to be able to play in his, uh, you know, in his playground and, uh, and, you know, essentially, you know, be part of Stephen King for, for the writing of the book. I was going to say Stephen King. I've, I've heard about yeah. him a lot lately. Maybe I should pick up one yeah. of his books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Al, Al, is that ringing a bell, Stephen yeah. King? Yeah, I, I I think so. I've heard a little bit <laughs> yeah. of gossip. I don't know. I uh, <laughs> waste, waste my time on these. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, you should be. Yeah. They're, they're usually yeah, you can find them. You can yeah. find them at your local <laughs> gas station pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Oh, oh good. I hang out at gas stations. <laughs> heard that. <laughs> now, seven, uh, seven yeah. plus year old Stephen <laughs> King, and he's just out there still cranking them out. I mean, he, he's an inspir- and he's you know he's obviously doing it because he loves it. That's the neat thing. I I think it's like he he doesn't need any more money in the bank, and he doesn't need any more houses and all that. And, but he but he's just he's still there doing it every day because he he loves you know the process, and that and to me that's that's pretty wonderful. Wow. Yeah. Are are there ever any, any ever any butting of heads or arguments or tense moments? Or is no, with, with Steve, it's been easy. I mean, I've collaborated with a number of people, including yeah. my son, who I talked about, and and uh, and again, you know, he takes every yeah. opportunity to be like, "All right, Dad, you know that might have worked back in the dinosaur days, but the, you know, right. that's not how uh, <laughs> you know that's not how electronics work." Um, and, and I had right. a, and I've I've written some films and, and television stuff with one of my childhood friends, Jonathan Shack, and and you know we're we're both very similar personalities, so we butted heads from time to time. But with Steve, number one, I think he knows. You know, it, it, there there's still that part of me that's that's like you know, no matter how tight we are, no matter no matter the fact that I can text him and rag on him when the Red Sox lose, you know, and and those kind of things. Yeah, it, there's still. You know, he he still knows that I'm. That there's a part of me that's walking around going, "Wow, you're the guy who wrote Carrie." You know, I always think of the Saturday Night Live. Right, right, yeah. So he's not gonna he's not gonna like BS his way around that or try and make it like yeah, like like force it to be something other. Right. Than what and, it is. and here's the thing: as as kind and as generous um, as as Steve is, and as funny and intelligent, and all these other wonderful things I can say, you know, he he's still. Stephen King, he's still the 800-pound gorilla in the room. So yeah. when it comes to writing, he, you know, yeah, if there's something he wants, he's going to tell you. But we've never really had that, you know. He, uh, you know, he's been the most gentle, generous, you know, collaborator in that regard. And 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 the the big thing I I key on, and and my corny butt, you know, actually texted this to him when we were writing the last book. I was like, this is what a true collaboration should be because we were both yeah. having a blast, and it, and it just felt like it was a you know, it felt like it was almost like the, this challenging chess match where it was like, okay, now I've brought us back to Derry. Let's see what you do with it. You know, we've left Castle Rock and now we're in Derry. Let's see where you go next. And, you know, I've had people say, oh, my God, you've got some cojones to do that. And I'm just like, but that's the atmosphere that he set up was this very yeah. freewheeling, creative um, stew where it's just like, hey, we both got our hands in the pot. Let's Now let's have fun. And yeah. Um, I have to ask you too. Is it 
in terms of his mindset with being self-aware, to some extent he's the 800-pound 800, 800 gorilla. Maybe he sees it that way, maybe he doesn't. But he understands who he is in the context. On some level, is there also an impetus of, Rich, I'm going to hook you into a cash register that's going to explode? You know what I mean? Like, like just, it's inevitably going to sell tons of copies. So right. was that sentiment ever expressed on any level, or it's more like we're just going to go have fun? No, it, it, it's much smaller scale. Just we're going to have fun. And, and to kind of on that, to kind of put a highlight on that, when we wrote Gwendy's Button Box, there was no discussion of what length it would be, uh, right. what what we were going to do with it. I remember when we were finished, I, I, we kept sending the manuscript back and forth. And, you know, because it was a pre-existing story, at the top of the first page, it said, Gwendy's Button Box by Stephen King. I refused to add my name to it. And it wasn't until the last section came back to me that Steve added, you know, and Richard Chismar to, to the byline. And I remember seeing that and just having a big smile on my face. And when we were finished, when we both decided, okay, the story's done, it, we kind of looked at each other and said, what next? Because we never discussed what we were going to do with it. Um, yeah. And if he would have said, Rich, let's just put it in a drawer, I, I promise you I would have been just as happy because of, because of the experience. It's a fantasy, yeah. Yeah, but then we kind of said, what do you want to do with it? And, and I had published a book of his called uh, Blockade Billy, um, and it was a short little book, and it was a, kind of an oddity, and it was illustrated, and, and we had a lot of fun with it. Um, and, and that's kind of how we decided. We said, well, why don't we publish, you know, Gwenny's Button Box the same, you know, model it after Blockade Billy. And, you know, we published it, and I'm telling you, I had no, you know, we obviously we sold a ton of copies and all that, but I never even thought about bestseller lists or any of those things. And I was in a 7-Eleven, and I looked at Below the Fold on a USA Today, and the, it, it had the top five selling books in the country that week. And uh, Gwenny's Button Box was number five, and I almost... Yeah, I almost lost it and met the floor. How could you not? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that kind of puts it in perspective. Is is from both of us? I, I don't think, you know, I, you're you're right. He has to be very aware that okay, I, I am going to be pulling Rich by the uh, back of his T-shirt into another, you know, uh, uh, another uh, existence here as far as uh, you know, books sold and all those things. But it, it just we, we never really thought about it, talked about it. And it was just this big happy surprise that then turned into more. So, again, wow. I mean, Does it, um, has it crossed over into a positive effect on you uh, putting out solo work? For sure, for sure. Commercially, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think with chasing the boogeyman, it, it, everything from probably you know the the amount of the advance to you know how much support the publisher put behind it to the fact that they could say I was a New York Times bestselling author on the front you know, dust jacket, um, all of that had to play into effect. And and that's when, when Boogeyman actually debuted on the New York Times bestseller list. I, you know, I sent a screenshot to Steve and I said, you're probably more responsible f for this than I am. So thank you. And, and of course he wrote back and, you know, that's, bull oh my. But, but again, it, it, yeah, it, it, it changes things. Yeah. Uh, what, but before we move on from the King topic, who is, who is co-written with him? It's his sons. It's Peter Straub and it's you. Is there anybody uh, else? Stuart O'Nan, who, uh, who wrote the baseball okay. book with Steve and he wrote one novella called, uh, uh, Face in the Crowd, um, which is only available on, on ebook and, and audio. But that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a small, uh, group of people. So. You can count on one, you can count them on one hand and two of them are his blood. Right. So that's a, that, that's a, not only a colossal honor, but a huge testament to how talented you are. I mean, uh, you know, you're you're in there uh, sparring with Muhammad Ali, so somehow, somehow, <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah I, but you, you have to also look at it. Uh, it, it doesn't it make you, in a sense, vulnerable? Because um, you're when you're when you're writing something with him, isn't everybody that is going to read it going to compare you to him? Oh yeah, yeah. So, I mean. If, and in every way. I mean, again, those Facebook ads are, are wonderful because people see, you know, that I've written with Stephen King and they see, you know, the Stephen King blurb on the front of uh, Chasing the Boogeyman. So somehow, you know, half of the comments on these end up being about politics. You know, yeah. I'm not buying it. <laughs> oh, right. You know, I'm not buying yeah. this book. King, you know, I, and then they're like, you know, I used to read everything, Steve. Rove. I, don't, I don't read any of it now. And, you know, so, yeah, it, it of course. Yeah. And. and what I what I was scared of was that you know his constant readers would be like who is this pretender and blah 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 and of course you're going to get some of that no matter what you know other than having fun reading those aloud to my family I don't sweat them I just I'm like you know hey as long as you bought the book I'm appreciative and you know every once in a while I might be like you know 
that was really mean. And but I'm still saying it with a smile because that's just my personality. And I'm like, hunt them down and kill them. Yeah, <laughs> or like you know, it's like my God, they want to hunt me down and kill me because they didn't yeah. like it. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's America. Theory. Yeah, but you know, I also have to wonder because you say that you're a very private person and you're not really into the you know, all of the conventions and all this wild stuff. But doesn't that, in a sense, like when you're sharing so much of yourself and listing it as yourself, because like when we write books, we can we can have ourselves in the character or parts of what we think and do and how we behave, but it doesn't list us as me, you know. Right. So when you list it as, here's Richard Chismar, and then you're talking about your feelings and what you like and don't like and, and things that have affected you emotionally, doesn't that sort of it, 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 that takes a certain amount of courage, I think, to put that out to where thousands and thousands of people are going to read it, and it makes you kind of vulnerable in a way. Yeah, and it, it, it again, I, I wish I was. I, I need to be more self-aware about these things because, again, I just you know there was the acknowledgement of the fact that hey, this is weird, and and like like I said, all my friends were thrilled to have me talk about that. My wife did not. She's she's very much behind the scenes, <laughs> extremely, and and she was the only one who wasn't thrilled. But you know. She she let me run with it, but it, it was my agent, uh, Kristen Nilsson, who who was wonderful, and and she said early on, you know, once the book uh, was published and, and looked like it was going to be a success, she kind of just said, you know, Rich, I, I'm so happy for you because this was a really brave decision, you know, for you to run with this and and, and essentially lay yourself out there for a lot of people. And I uh, I remember a conversation I had with my son. I said, you know, when he was worried about, again, the, the Blair Witch aspect of it. And I was like, Billy, we don't know whether 50 people are going to read this or 500 or how many. I said, so I'm not worried about it, it you know. Um, but, but yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Looking back on it, talking about my dad the way I did, you know, in, in ways of watching him get ready for work and kind of having the understanding dawning on me that this is how you take care of your family. And just some of those intimate moments that are are – crucial as far as you know making me the person i am today um yeah you know yeah you're vulnerable because somebody can read that and be like you know this guy's full of it or that's ridiculous or or whatever but again you just kind of have to have faith that the story you're telling is 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 important enough to myself to to lay it out there are you going to be the next jack reacher in book two no but but it is funny because (laughs) i was walking the dogs with with my wife and and oldest son my youngest is is away at, at college at uva and so the three of us were walking the dogs and I, I was, they were poking fun at me about being out of shape or something. I said, well, not in the next book. I'm running six foot, uh, you know, I'm going to set several scenes on this trail as I'm running my six, my six minute miles. And they just cracked up. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to be a damn superhero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's going to be, it's going to be me. It's, it's going to be me modern day with all of my, uh, with all of my faults. So. Well, looking, looking back on things, what would you change? Uh, regarding the book or life? <laughs> Uh, well, they've had, with you, it's probably very uh, intertwined, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I wouldn't change much. anything. I mean, you know, maybe I would have been a, you know, I was a very type A person, you know, coming up. I was, you know, I was an athlete, and so I was just used to just bulldozing through things instead of sometimes taking a step back and, and kind of giving it thought. And, and I, I think I was a slow learner in that way. I, you know, I tell people my business succeeded dis- despite me, not because of me, because you know, I, I made so many mistakes, but I was, you know, I had a, a really good work ethic and uh, just such a passion for what I was doing. So um, I, I, it just feels like I always chose to do it the hard way. So, you know, I look back at those kind of things and I'm like, yeah, I, I would have made life on people around me a little easier. But uh, you know what? I had cancer when I was 29 and it came back when I was 30 and, and I kind of learned some lessons there. And, um, you know, obviously not enough because I, I do feel like it was probably a, a, when I hit 40 that I kind of just slowed down and, and, and let things come to me more. But uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm, I'm one of those people who wakes up grateful every day and kind of just goes from there. Uh, Rich, what sort of cancer did you have? Uh, I started as testicular when I was 29 and then, you know, they, okay. they removed one and, the, and I, they, they did a lymph node dissection, you know, so I have a cool scar that looks like a shark bite in my torso. Okay. And they told me it's never coming back. 99%, you know, you were the most horrible. Oh, wow. And then six months later, it was in both lungs, my liver, um, my, wow. my lymph nodes, and my stomach. Uh, so that's gone back 25 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. And they, uh, 
at that point they told me it's a it's fifty fifty, and I and I remember telling them, well, it's it, you're just telling me that, so I'll so I'll so I'll fight because it, it's not all these places, and and you know the tumor in my stomach was the size of a fist, and I'm like, you know, it's not fifty fifty, but I got I got lucky. I had twelve weeks of chemo and and came out, you know, a, a good you know a, a fixed man, and um, you know all these. Were, were you uh, were you married with children at that point? I didn't have children. As a matter of fact, they told me I, I was married. To, to the same woman, to poor Kara, and uh, but th- that was one of the after effects of all the chemo because they blasted me. They said, "You're young, you're in good shape. We're going to hit you as hard as you can hit someone with with this chemo." Yeah. And, and I I did four courses of a week in the hospital and two weeks outpatient, and they said, "You're not going, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be able to have kids naturally." So you know, do the old sperm bank thing, and and that was the thing we uh, we conceived, our, you know, both of our kids, both of our sons. Uh, you know, naturally, and, and I still remember the day my wife said, you know, I'm feeling sick, and, da, da, da. and I said, maybe you're pregnant. She got mad at me because it's yeah. not funny. You shouldn't be joking about that, and she took a home pregnancy test, and we went to the doctors, and all the nurses, you know, called my oldest son, Billy, the miracle baby. So, again, you know, how, how can I not wake up every day with the life I've had and just, you know, be grateful and try to pass it on best I can? Oh, uh, you're not kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um uh, uh, now, how do you do? You like to interact on social media with fans, or do you have a website? How do you like people to, I do. to get with you? Yeah, I mean, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and I have my own website, RichardChismore.com. And I'm the last guy. I had to be kicked in. I had to be dragged into that like ten years ago, kicking and screaming, and I ended up loving it because you know I reconnected with with old teammates from high school and college, and. Uh, you know, I, you know, it's a great way to stay in time. I sound like an ad, but it, I just ended up being the most surprised person, you know, on earth because I'm like, Hey, I actually love this. And, uh, it's, it's neat to talk to readers. And I've, I've been, I, I know other writers say it's a nightmare and they have to constantly block people. And I've been lucky. I, you know, I've blocked maybe a half a dozen people in 10 years. And, um, you know, one of, yeah. one of those was, yeah. was for, for saying every other day, you, you know, you, you must, you know, have pictures of Stephen King in compromising positions because why else would he write Luther like you? <laughs> it took like 20 of those comments before I finally was like, hey, you know what, I'm just going to block you. But, yeah, I've been for Yeah, yeah. Well, we always have those, but overall it is, it's, a, it's an amazing tool to communicate with people. And it is. I think it's great. It's just, yeah, you have to be careful because there is those weirdos out there. But, you know. Yeah, I what, absolutely what owe a, a huge debt to uh, – you know, to uh, social media for, for chasing the boogeyman success. They, they really, word of mouth was a huge factor and did a ton of giveaways and promotions for it. And then we all had fun with it. And yeah, I, it, it's, it's been neat to, to experience. Well, when you're doing the, 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 the newer book on this, um, you're going to be modern times. Are you, are you going to dare to bring in things like the uh, pandemic? Um, you know, I, I, I'm just going to touch on the pandemic. I thought you were going to say, am I going to bring in the social media? And I was going to say, yeah, absolutely, because that's one of the kind of one of the focuses of the second book is is just how there is this fascination with with evil and, and, and bad people. And um, the fact that, uh, you know, there can be a serial killer in, in custody and, and you can go on the Internet and Google and he's actually got fan clubs and message boards, you know, devoted to them. Um, so, you know, we're going to explore that kind of thing. But as far as the, the pandemic, uh, not too much. Uh, I mean, you know, I, uh, we, we, we definitely touch on it a bit in, in Gwenny's final task. But in, in the case of this story, we're kind of hopefully, you know, coming out the other end of it to, to, to some extent. So I'll, I'll leave that in the background unless something happens in the next few months. God forbid. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of one of those things that it might be better to stay away from in a sense that you don't know really where it's going to go. Right. Exactly right. Wow. So, uh, what are your projects now? What are what are people got to look forward to? Um, the big thing is uh, is Wendy's final task in February. It'll be out in hardcover in February, and then Simon Schuster is coming is piggybacking on with a, a, a trade paperback very quickly. That'll be out in June, and then the trade paperback for uh, Chasing the Boogeyman will be out in July. So, it, it you know, I, I hopefully I'll, I'll have a nice little presence there and bookstores come next summer. And then uh, the book I'm currently writing is the sequel. So I'm assuming that'll be out sometime the following year. And uh, yeah, hopefully people won't get sick of me. Oh. Well, I don't think they will, but it's something to look forward to. That's for sure. I mean, uh, definitely we'll have all this up on our website as well. So people can find you real easy, which I'm sure they can. 
you know, and, and, and I'm definitely going to have to look for the new Stephen King. I'm just not sure if I'm into that sort of romance drama sort of thing. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, look for the covers with the men with their shirts off and the muscular torsos. That's, well, that's him. Yeah, yeah. That's who He'll he is. Right. Oh, okay. I know. It's always his okay. face. It's always his yeah. face and his model. So, yeah, and, if, and if you guys want a, uh, an advanced copy of, of Finals Task, just, just uh, drop me an email. I'll be happy to send it to you. We will, yes. Well, our guest, Richard Chismar, the future Jack Reacher. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having me. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks. Get the latest news and opinions from Eric Shapiro from the House of Mystery website in the Shapiro Report. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.